Hello and welcome to another episode of Autogefühl. Today with me AJ and Thomas B. Today we are here in Immendingen at Mercedes-Benz's high-tech test facility. It's got high-speed ovals, off-road parkour, racetracks, the works, the perfect playground and we have the perfect toys to play in it. Like for example, this 1955 Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Coupe, the Gullwing. Let's take a closer look. Quick history lesson, so back in 1952, Mercedes-Benz had a very successful race car, the W194. Max Hoffman, who was Mercedes-Benz's USA distributor, convinced the board to make a road-going version of this car, and they agreed. So, in the 1954 New York Auto Show, they came out with this, the W198. And this, at that time, was really a supercar. Of course, there were other cars like the Lamborghini Miura, but uh, it's debated that this perhaps was the first uh, supercar of all time. Up front we have a large three-point grille and the two wings flanking it. It's a beautiful design, so much of chrome on the bumpers, an incredibly low profile at the hood. You can imagine compared to modern day cars. I mean, if you just look over there at the spiritual successor, the new SLS, you see so many of the similarities. Um, but as we go continue along the side, the chrome bumper comes here as well. And another iconic design element of the 300SL Gullwing are these eyebrows over the wheel arches. Of course, it's there to look beautiful, but also serves a little bit of a purpose. For example, when there's rain on the road, this helps prevent the water splashing onto the windshield. Also, there is a rear view mirror up here in the front on the hood itself, on the body because as you can see the A-pillar is really narrow and we'll come to the doors in a minute of course but uh, again just such an old classic 50s design I also love the louvers, these gills on the side which again just add so much character as well as serving a purpose to help ventilate the air from below the car to help aerodynamics as we go along the side more chrome along the bottom a beautiful Mercedes-Benz badging down here now as you might already know, well, this is the gullwing. So you pull this up and the door goes upwards. Now, why is that? Does it just look cool? Well, sure, but actually, if you look down here, this is a huge sill, and that's because the 300 SL was built with a space frame, tubular frame rather, uh, made of chrome molybdenum. denim. In fact, the SL stands for super light um, in German. And because this frame goes underneath here, and along the sides of the body, it was not possible to have conventional doors which opened this way because this section of the frame down here uh, was crucial uh, for the rigidity of the body. And therefore, this was a design necessity and not something that they did just uh, to make it look cool. We'll take a little bit of a closer look inside once I get inside and I can tell you so much more about it. Um, but as we go further back, you can see that there is quite a large area here in the back to store your suitcases. In fact, this is probably the only place you could fit any luggage. It is not too large, but enough for a couple suitcases back then. As we come towards the rear of the car, just a beautiful shape, very smooth, very round edges, a large exhaust tip over here. We'll talk about the engine in a minute shiny chrome bumpers all around. In fact, there's also eyebrows on the rear wheel arches, although in this case it doesn't really serve a purpose, it's just also there for design symmetry. Lights down here. Also love these shark fin uh, bumper extensions over here. Again, a classic timeless design. A nice curved um, trunk hood on the lid with more badging 300 SL written down here. Unfortunately I can't open this right now because I need a key but inside as well there isn't much space because it is taken up by the spare wheel as well as the fuel tank. 
So not the most practical car, but what makes it special is the way it looks and of course the way it drives. Under this gorgeous clamshell bonnet is just one of the most beautiful things I've seen in a very long time. This is the heart of the 300 SL. It's a three liter straight six petrol engine with mechanical direct fuel injection that was derived from the Messerschmitt fighter plane from World War II. In fact, at that time, this was the first production car ever to use this technology. This made 243 PS at a pretty high 6,100 RPM, but then again, back in that time, this was quite common. This was made to a four-speed manual transmission going to rear wheel drive. As you can see, this is a very low profile car, like I mentioned, very low bonnet. So in order to fit this behemoth of an engine, they had to tilt the entire engine by 50 degrees. So it's not standing this way, it's actually tilted by 50 degrees and it's kind of this way. And that also gives rise to this beautiful sand cast aluminium intake manifold as well. To stop this uh, car, there are four ventilated drum brakes all around. Not very confidence inspiring because the top speed of this is 263 kilometers per hour, which at that time made this the world's fastest production car. Let's take a look inside. Wow, getting inside is a bit of an occasion in itself because like I mentioned, this huge um, sill makes it a bit tricky. However, you have a little bit of a, uh, you know, something to help you out. You can flip the steering wheel down. It's not the most elegant ingress if I'm honest, but who cares? Nobody's looking at you. Everybody's looking at the car and this pops back in. Wow, a beautiful, thin, two-spoke steering wheel, ivory color, smooth, very nice, pedal feel all across. In fact, there is quite a lot of room. So yes, the frame does take up a lot of space, but you know, it's not, it's not too cramped. For two people who are not too large, it's actually fairly comfortable. If I were to put this, the door down, it is a little bit claustrophobic, you feel like the sky is falling on top of you, but I do have just about enough headroom. I'm five foot eight. Well, I guess people in the 50s were shorter, so, you know, it's, uh, it's not too bad. The seats are very comfortable. You're sitting very low. In fact, this is a very sporty seating position because my feet are stretched out all the way forward. As you can see, my knees are also really down. There really is, um, it's not like you're sitting on the car, you're really sitting in the car. It feels like I'm sitting in a bathtub <laughs> with all these sills around me. But, oh my God, I mean, look at these gorgeous styles. There's so many, you know, analog, beautiful dials. This, this is what I love. I mean, there's a fuel meter, there's a speedometer, there's a, uh, sorry, a tachometer, a speedometer, a water gauge, an oil pressure gauge, um, an oil temperature gauge, and a bunch of, you know, clocks and toggles and switches simple clock over here as well a central rear view mirror on the inside not um, attached to the affixed to the roof but rather here on the dashboard that's so cool it also even has a day and night functionality how cool is that and it works <laughs> it's fantastic and honestly now that i'm sitting in the car the rear view mirror outside is actually really useful i mean i can see the rear haunch of the car and yeah it gives me a good vis a good idea on the the, the, the perimeter or the periphery of this car. A large transmission tunnel here in the middle, very soft seats, no headrest. Of course, back then you didn't really, you know, it was not that common, but the seats are very comfortable. It's also kind of leaning back. So you do have under thigh support, a thin shift lever for the four speed manual. And I mean, it's all about the driving sensation. 
So I think it's about time I shut up and just go for a drive. Let's take out the 300 SL for a quick spin around this high-speed oval racetrack. Three liter straight six, 243 PS, four-speed manual. Wow. First impressions. Well, back when the W194 racetrack, uh, you know, was uh, developed, they had a lot of things in mind. One important thing was to keep it very reliable and in a very interesting way, keep it very comfortable because you see a lot of races back then were endurance races and the drivers needed to be alert and uh, you know comfortable enough to keep on the racetrack for longer and the mechanical fuel injection also enabled the car to have more reliable sustainable performance um, but yeah because of that race heritage the 300 SL in my opinion had a few drawbacks first of all the frame which of course gave rise to the gull wing which I think is fantastic also meant that getting inside was a little bit harder. The rear axle also pivoted, and if you were at high speed and hit a bump, the pivot would be so much that the camber would change so drastically, and the car would just kind of move around quite a lot. And of course, the large fuel tank and the spare wheel meant the trunk was really not usable at all. These issues were all fixed with the 300 SL Roadster, and I got to drive that on some country roads earlier today, and I just fell in love. And I think that car is just, I think it's a lot more better than this. Of course, the coupe is iconic, but I think the Roadster just made it a much more enjoyable, usable road car. It has a very low center of gravity. In fact, the seating position is really fantastic. It's spot on. You can change the railings to make the seat lower. You can put different cushions so you can really manually adjust um, the seating position. But in this position, I have still plenty of headroom. It's not that uh, uh, claustrophobic inside as well. It's fairly wide. Even though the window sills or the door sills are still pretty big, uh, you still have space to move your elbow a little bit on the inside. Visibility is not too bad either. So on the whole, it's a great, great sports car. Visibility in the front is a bit limited, to be honest. But that means, you know, the tall dashboard gives you good visibility to the uh, to the dials steering is a little bit vague the brakes are not the best either you really have to stand on them the ventilated drum brakes of course uh, from the 50s were not you know the most uh, most reliable but yeah if i come to a stop it's very easy to heel toe just kick the throttle and it's the gearbox i think is actually pleasantly surprised me it's a very nice gearbox it's very easy to find the gears you don't really find any false neutrals. It's very easy to shift. The clutch is also fairly light. So on the whole, the 300 SL really lives up to its expectation. I think it truly is the first supercar. Out on normal country roads and not on the oval high-speed racetrack, a few things also come into play. First of all, even at fairly low speeds, I'm still going only about 40 kilometers per hour right now. The car is very, very loud. The engine is very loud. It's very hot inside. Of course, I have the ventilation on, but it's not very effective. On a hot summer day like this, the metal just cooks you inside. And that's also when you start feeling a little bit hemmed in because of this, um, yeah, this kind of low visibility, less windows. You can, of course, open this and it makes life a little bit better but um, on the whole it is quite loud and quite hot in here but the handling is really good the steering is also fairly nimble sound insulation definitely like in this tunnel now I can just hear everything humming so it's uh, it's not uh, it's not very quiet and comfortable the seats are yeah for longer distances like this not the most comfortable either going around corners like this the steering wheel does get fairly heavy so you really have to wrestle with it but again it's it's fun to do that the gearbox really is fantastic I really enjoy the gearbox and because of the pedals and the position it's very easy to do a quick heel toe let's listen to that straight six oh <laughs> fantastic the gearing is also quite tall 
So, I mean, in, it only has four gears and you can hit, hit uh, top speed uh, in fourth gear. So, gearing is quite tall. In fact, the first gear is there just to help you set off and not much more than that. But, you know, all of these impracticalities or all of these little quirks also is what makes the 300SL a supercar. The performance, the extravagance, the doors, but it's everything else, it's the personality, it's all of these things put together that I think really makes the 300SL truly the first uh, supercar in the world.